Thank you so very much. <clears throat> it's a privilege to be here today in this moment at this time with you. Lisa, thank you for that very kind introduction. Standing here in this space makes me feel so alive right now. To imagine that I'm standing in the same space that Reverend Howard Moody once stood, with the same visual that he once had as he stood here and pastored in this space. Uh, but I think what was more important is that a few years ago, as a Christian, I was able to capture the vision that he championed about 50 years ago this week when I began to see the need of my patients in the form of abortion and move from sympathy to compassionate action. I'm, com I'm keenly aware that as I'm standing in this pulpit to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the clergy consultation service, I'm very moved to stand in front of some of the original participants. As far as I'm concerned, you are saints in my eyes. Uh, the champions of women. You were prophets because you heard uh, what nobody else heard and you answered on behalf of women. So I thank you for that. It's in that tradition as a member of the delegation for RCRC that I celebrate the 50th anniversary of this clergy consultation service. It's kind of like the kids coming home to honor the parents <laughs> because out of the clergy consultation service arose RCRC. RCRC, we take great pride in our roots in the clergy consultation service because we are inspired by the courage and the prophetic vision of you people and those who stood along with you to take great risk to do what was right. We take great pride and we especially give thanks for Reverend Howard Moody. As an abortion provider, who is also a Christian, I stand for you here today. I hope, because in the Christian tradition, we believe that there's a great cloud of witnesses that those who are not with us remain with us. And so I hope as Reverend Moody looks down on us and speaks within us, that if there's joy to be experienced on the other side of wherever he is, that he feels a moment of joy right now to have someone who provides abortion standing in this space to declare the morality of that work. So as I stand here as a Christian, I stand here before you today because my reproductive advocacy work is expressed not just medically and not just politically, but it's also expressed religiously. Like the members who led the charge to legalize abortion, we need that type of moral power and faith at this moment in this time in our movement because now the movement is considered highly secular, and I don't use secular and sacred to make false distinctions, but what I want you to know is that the movement for abortion rights did not start out that way. In recent years, it's been the appalling silence of the faith community that has created the striking irony now that what was once the loudest voice catalytic for abortion, that of compassionate religious leadership, has now been replaced by judgmental religious patriarchy. This is an ahistoric narrative because history of the movement sits here. The narrative of abortion rights in this country has, because it's been oblivious to the history of the clergy consultation service, it's facilitated and given the marginalizing, hazard-inducing perspective of religious patriarchy a validation that it does not deserve. Howard Thurman, the great Christian mystic who influenced Dr. King, amongst many others, once said that the things that are in religion are true the things that are in religion are in religion because they are true. They are not true because they are in religion. That is to say that 
while we may have adopted the patriarchal custom of shaming women for controlling their reproduction and their bodies, as re and we've adopted that as religious commandment, just because we've done that doesn't make it the truth. And that's why anniversaries of this sort are both tricky and important. As we remember what this group of heretical prophetic clergy, and you might ask what's the difference between a, her a heretic and a prophet, I'll explore that in a minute. <laughs> but as these prophetic heretical clergy who changed this country on abortion did 50 years ago, as we now look back, do we look back in pride with an example of what can be if we had other voices today so similarly situated? Or do we look back with the anxiety that our society is doubling back on itself to a time where we imperil the lives of women by denying them access to the health care that is abortion? Again, I say it is, the, it is this lost legacy that facilitates the return of that danger. That legacy is not lost on me, however because it empowers me daily to do the work that I do. As RCRC being one of the, one if, of, if not the only interfaith advocacy group working for reproductive health rights and justice, my participation in that movement and my awareness of my history as an offshoot of the clergy consultation service allows me to, when anti-abortion zealots seek to harass me by telling me that I cannot be a Christian because I provide abortions, I know better. What they don't understand is that because I'm a Christian, that is precisely why I provide abortion care, because I see my work as the fulfillment of a prophetic call to justice, reproductive justice. And because I see that, I don't question or seek to establish the notion that I'm a prophet, but they see me as a heretic. And again, what is the difference between a heretic and a prophet? Well, I can't tell you what the difference is in my case because I've never assessed myself with regard to whether or not I'm a heretic or a prophet. But I will, with your permission, invite you to look back at the lives of two people that I consider prophets after whom I've modeled my life because I'm convinced that the difference between a heretic and a prophet is time and perspective. <laughs> so, and if you allow me to do that, I will honor the life and the prophetic witness of someone who once stood in this pulpit, the Reverend Howard Moody, in whose name I was once honored for the very important work that I do. And it makes it special for me to stand here as well because in the audience is his widow that I had the pleasure to meet this morning. So it was important for me to touch the hands that once held his hands. Now, the prophetic tradition is a long and ancient one. And simply defined, a prophet is one who speaks for God, or, while, and, and that's the simple definition. And while many claim to do, though, they don't always uh, know or understand what it means to be a prophet because people aren't drawn to prophets. First, prophets are not recognized as such when they speak forth the truth that demands a different reality because prophets see things that other people don't see. When others embrace the status quo, prophets see injustice because others in the status quo are often blinded by their, pri by their privilege. The prophets who see something different and call for something different are called heretics. A heretic is a professed believer who maintains religious opinions that are contrary to the more popular ones or the doctrines that are accepted. And because of that, uh, with that definition of a heretic, I would argue that in times of injustice that's often officially sanctioned by the religious status quo, one could not be a prophet without first becoming a heretic. <laughs> Thinking back to the time as, that we seek to revisit this morning in 1967, a person calling for racial equality during legal segregation, or a person who seeks safe abortion for women when it's illegal and criticized by the church was definitely considered a heretic. Dr. Martin Luther King was a heretic by the account of many well-church segregationists of his day. Reverend Howard Moody was a heretic by church standards in supporting abortion when it was illegal. We now know their voices to have been prophetic. 
When I look back at the lives of those that we now call prophets because the truth that they envisioned ultimately came forth, I'm reminded of the words of someone who once said that we criticize our living nonconformists and we praise our dead heroes. I saw your quote on the church billboard by Margaret Atwood this morning about heroes, and I agree with her, but I pledge to you that while some people call me a hero, based on that definition of praising dead heroes, I'm doing all that I can not to become a hero. <laughs> Dr. King is now revered as a prophet of racial justice and peace, but his criticism of the Vietnam War led to his having the lowest public approval ratings ever right before his death. There were also those who didn't take kindly to Reverend Moody's uh, notion uh, that uh, ultimately in his other work led him to become infamous for doing heretical things like starting the first drug treatment clinic in Greenwich Village and ministering to sex workers and AIDS patients. But during the time when he fought to liberalize abortion laws as the next big social justice movement of his time, those who were comfortable with the status quo didn't think that his advocacy was appropriate for a religious minister. However, Reverend Moody saw and heard things differently. The year was 1967 and too many women in New York City were dying. The New York City legislature had failed to pass any reform to the state's strict anti-abortion laws leaving the status quo in place. At that time, half of the maternal mortality in New York City was due to deaths resulting from illegal abortions. And while wealthy women could use their connections to have illegal yet safe abortions performed in hospitals, the less privileged women didn't have that option. As Jay-Z, the New York-born rap mogul and ex entertainer once said, men lie, women lie, but numbers don't. According to a survey of low-income women who had abortions in the 1960s, eight out of 10 of those women said that they had attempted a self-induced procedure, and only 2% of those women said that a trained physician was involved in any way in their effort to end their pregnancy. It was against this backdrop that Reverend Moody, a former Marine who maintained a buzz cut until the end of his days at 91, the minister of this historic Judson Memorial Church, decided that he couldn't stand by and watch any longer. And see, that's the nature of prophets. Prophets know that they cannot watch injustice and do nothing because their vision has shown them what can be. Reverend Moody started gathering with a group of faith leaders, some of whom are probably here, to talk about how they might help women get connected with doctors who could provide safe abortions. Those pastors and rabbis formed what came to be known as the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion. Another thing about prophets is that they see and hear things that other people don't. They see injustice where other people see the status quo. Then the prophet says, like Robert F. Kennedy, there are those who, that look at things the way they are and ask why. I dream of things that never were and ask why not. Prophets ask, why can't women have safe, uh, why can't women have access to safe, affordable abortion? Why can't they have access to contraception and medically accurate sex education? Prophets ask, why can't we stop mass incarceration? Why can't we stop extrajudiciary execution of black people in the streets by police or the execution of any person under the death penalty? Why not? Another thing about prophets is that they are very public in their visions and their declarations. They know that they don't hide in the shadows. They know that there's no clandestine way to do justice work. Justice cannot be secret. It must declare itself. Dr. King and his followers openly practiced integration and thereby indicted segregation as immoral, and they accepted the consequences that came with that. With that same vision that May, this month, 50 years ago, the Clergy Consultation Service announced their new organization in a front page ad in the New York Times. In consultation with the New York Civil Liberties Union, these religious leaders decided that their best strategy for avoiding getting in trouble with the law at that time, the charge for, quote, aiding and abetting an illegal abortion was a $1,000 fine and a year in prison. They decided that the best strategy was total transparency. They decided that the truth will do. They decided that there was no need for alternative facts. 
They wanted to operate out in the open, sending the message that they were choosing to defy the law in order to adhere to a higher moral code. And they ultimately initiated a long yet mostly overlooked history of clergy assisted work towards ensuring women's reproductive autonomy. Where's our equivalent of the clergy consultation service today? Where is it? Now I know that the progeny of, our, of clergy consultation service, RCERC, is here and we're finding our prophetic voice and role. But as Dr. King often cried out in anguish to the church writ large, where's the church? Where's the faith community as we march toward the unnecessary death and suffering that is occurring around the world, exacerbated by the international gag order of this current administration? Where's the church as our government threatens to bring that same carnage home to our uh, women in our country as they seek to overturn the Affordable Care Act and to defund organizations like Planned Parenthood and thereby deprive people of their health care that they're entitled to as human beings? Where's the church? Where's the faith community? Will our legacy be, will we, as Ella Wheeler Wilcox said, sin by silence when we should protest, thereby making cowards out of us all? The answer has to be no. We no longer must work underground, but we must act as boldly as Reverend Moody and these people did from this pulpit and with his colleagues in the clergy consultation service. We must not allow the lives of women to be imperiled due to what Dr. King called the appalling silence of good people in the face of injustice. We must stand up, speak up, stand out, and stand on behalf of reproductive justice. One of Dr. King's mentors and supporters during the Civil Rights Movement, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, the rabbi, if you see the pictures with the white hair on the Selma to Montgomery March, who once famously said that as we marched for justice, it felt as if my legs were praying. He was invited to participate in a meeting of clergy at the White House to address the Negro problem by John F. Kennedy. He sent him the following telegram on June 16, 1963. He said, Mr. President, I look forward to the privilege of being present at the meeting tomorrow at 4 p.m. The likelihood exists that the Negro problem will be like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything about it. Please demand more of religious leaders' personal involvement and not just a solemn declaration. We forfeit the right to worship God as long as we continue to hum humiliate Negroes. Churches and synagogues have failed. They must repent. The hour calls for high moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. If you let me contemporize Rabbi Heschel's words to President Kenny, Kennedy by saying that like the Negro question of Heschel's time, we as a faith community are failing women and we must repent. Women, are, women need more from us than solemn declarations and sympathy. They deserve compassionate action, healing, and support. Like Rabbi Heschel says, as long as we deny them that, we forfeit our right to worship God as we continue to participate in the humiliation of women. A God of justice who champions those who live with their backs against the wall cannot hear prayers that are indifferent to the oppressed. So I will close by returning to our point of departure that for the, the prophetic words of Isaiah that you heard reading in your, uh, in, your, in your reading. The spirit of the Lord God is upon us because the Lord has anointed us to preach good tidings unto the meek has sent us to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and to comfort all that mourn. And in the words from the book of James, pure and undefiled religion for God is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. I'm of the persuasion that what is heard is more important than what is said. In these words, the prophet Isaiah calls us to justice. In these words, I hear social justice, carceral justice, reproductive justice, the proclamation of liberty. Do you hear what I hear? Will you answer this call? 
If so, then you must be willing to be a heretic because you must look at our society and ask why these things are not so, even as evangelical Christianity willingly serves as the papacy for governmental injustice. If you are not willing to be thought of as non-patriotic as we cover injustice in a thin veneer of nationalism, then don't answer. But if you must answer the call to justice from the depths of your soul, then the letter to James gives us the metric, especially in response to reproductive justice. Your religious integrity is determined by how you treat the most vulnerable people in our society, widows and orphans. I once heard a teacher commenting to make the distinction between the God of Israel and the Roman God Zeus or the God of the Roman Empire. That teacher said that the difference between the God of Rome and the God of Israel was Zeus loved women, but the God of Israel cared about orphans and widows. In Roman mythology, the primary interest that Zeus had in women was sexual. He often took human form to interact with women in that way and was otherwise indifferent to their status, whereas Yahweh concerned himself with the well-being of women and children. The question is, as I close, will we continue to worship God in the context of patriarchal religion? relegating women to the status of things or as incubators as we seek to control their lives and their bodies? Or will we care about women beyond their reproductive capabilities? Zeus or Yahweh? Which God will you serve this morning? Blessings upon us all.